could come up and speak when we get to that point, um, and then as, ask questions or provide comments. So we have a short presentation. And we're going to get started. So we're going to go over a few things this evening. Um, one of them is how we plan to end homelessness. Um, so a little bit about the operations and where we're at with that. Uh, site selection and project design, we do have some updates since the last meeting that we had, and then what's permitting and what is next for us. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Joe. Thank you very much. Um, I know we've seen this presentation in the two prior um, listening sessions, and this has been the document that's been around. These are the pillars that make up the core responses to not a facilitated process. This is not something that the administration just created a sure from um, a, a vast a variety of folks that provided input from local partners, national partners, national hub. So these are the pillars. And um, the one that we're addressing here is the navigation center. And uh, that navigation center has a shelter component to it. But the focus of that navigation center um, is to get the folks that are in a um, situation. It does not have to be on the street homelessness. It could just be in need of services, the social services they need to both deal with homelessness and to uh, prevent people from entering the homeless system as a preventative measure. Thank you. Um, is there any chance that is there any chance someone's online trying to maybe watch this and then we take comments? We have that set up. We don't have that kind of setup, sir, for Collins. Yeah, I don't have the same access the assembly does. This is just from our purview. Okay. Yeah. So, can you maybe zoom in to the people? So, um, I know some of the legal friend out of the uh, AO is there. So, you know, the whole intent of the navigation center is to be a center that someone can come to find it engaging, welcoming, and inviting. And what I mean by that is they may not be interested in at first coming in for residential services. So the, the real advantage of the NAV Center is through the day, the day engagement center. They can come and see what goes on, see folks being navigated. It's an open floor plan design. And that will allow them to see that there's, there's not a, a situation where you're forced into taking services. If they want services, they're able to access, access them. So the day engagement piece, one of the three major components of the NAV Center, allows them to come in, receive some light services, and see other folks entering and leaving the navigation process, hopefully showing them that that path is um, very easily accessed without a lot of barriers and welcoming them to the navigation options. Um, you know, as we speak here, we're really looking for an amazing operator. We're doing that in partnership with both the community of practice here in town and then the overarching um, national SMEs that we're out speaking to, and the plan is to have an experienced navigation center SME as part of the um, overarching structure that is the navigation center for Thank you. So coordinated entry is really one of the major keys to the navigation center being successful. And as this, as this picture shows, there's all kinds of resources from, you know, the street, which would be street outreach, folks that we go out and encounter, whether it be the ASP, whether it be a, uh, you know, through the school district, through the police, uh, through the safety patrol. We have, when we say clinics, we're talking about all those community providers and services out there that when they, when they encounter an individual that needs that support, that we're there for the phone call. Then we have the referrals, which, you know, like in a normal year, we always are running, which through telephone, through United Way.
term um, substance misuse uh, treatment, we're going to get them that when they come back and they're waiting for housing. That's the point of the MAP Center's dormitory side. It's not just to be this no, just come and hang out. It's to get navigated to the services and housing. That's the real benefit of the MAP Center. We don't have that now. Um, we have a center where you can come stay, but we don't have that throughput uh, to really get them into a housing situation or a housed situation that leads to the more productive outcomes. That I mean, it is clear that the best outcomes come from people having secure housing situations, not being sheltered just in and of itself. So that's what you see here. And if anyone at the end of this has questions, I'll be glad to speak to it in much more depth. Thank you. So these are some great examples of, we've talked to a ton of navigation centers across the country some serve as great examples of what to do, some serve as great examples of what might not work here. So we have the benefit of this is not a new operation, this is a highly successful footprint that's HUD encouraged to get people to serve But things that a lot of us take for granted, whether it's like some of the stuff lower, I think some of the easy to identify things we're all aware of, whether it be public benefits, you know, getting medical care, those are all given. But that little lower stuff, you'd be amazed how many services revolve around an ID. And we've come to learn from talking to the community uh, that we service that just going to the DMV over um, at the University uh, Mall, if they have warrant, they get the police call them. So this gives us an example of we can bring the mobile IT lab out. They have a mobile machine that comes out, and that would be a service because you would be amazed how many places just to sign up for anything. They need that ID, not a driver's license. So that's one of the examples that we learned from talking to them. And we have a transportation plan in progress. That transportation plan is multi fold from vouchers to getting to unique appointments to regular routes with the standing the standard clinics, whether it be South Central, Native Medical Center, Anchorage Neighborhood Health Center, and um, a lot of those standing facilities. We have that now at the Sullivan Arena, but it's actually being already in progress being refined for when Tudor and Elmore becomes up. stable situation due to anything that's going on they can come there for those services before they're in the street or sleeping in their car so that's the real benefit of this is that we can actually get some upline interventions before they end up needing to be sheltered so sometimes it's as simple as they're 50 dollars short of their rent and they don't have somebody to cover that gap we have programs for emergency rental assistance rapid rehousing that can really jump right in and keep these people help stabilize the situation before it gets um, to a point that they're facing a more dire situation. Thank you. So this is one of the um, slides that demonstrates one of the biggest challenges in Anchorage, which is the housing itself. We know from many, many reports that we are between two and 3,000 units, whatever that unit is, depending on the size of the family, a single person, a mixed situation, sometimes having a supportive family member with them. We recognize that. So one of the big challenges is going to be to try to find not only a place to, to have them while we navigate them, but a place to navigate them to. So integral to this are the other pillars or planks that we like to say back to the first slide, because it doesn't matter how much we do to get somebody through a substance misuse program and job training and all that. And we finally have them set to a point that they're ready to be um, in a house situation. We don't have that housing. So that's the other piece of this is situations like the guest house, uh, the sockeye in for, for people that have medical conditions. It's vital that we have a place to have needed to. So this isn't the end. This is the beginning of a new path. We're taking, we're taking a turn down a road that's a new path in Anchorage. And um, this is really what we're looking at here. Then the piece comes, we have this new program. How do you measure success? The optional term is functional zero. And I explain this a lot to people. This, this is not that we think we're going to end homelessness. The answer here is that the supply and the demand are enough to take care of the situation. We act as a conduit to get people to the situation that's right for them. 
So the idea that we're ever going to end homelessness isn't, isn't going to happen. Where we need to get people in proper placements and having a tool like the Navigation Center to when they, when they are struggling with whatever situation, whatever pain that they're dealing with, we don't care, we don't judge, they can come in and we help them. But the integral piece of this is, is housing. And the Navigation Center is the route to that housing. A lot of times they just don't know. So this is a place landlords can put themselves on a resource list. It's a place where they can go get that medical treatment. Maybe they'd be able to go to regular housing if we could overcome a minor medical challenge. Um, those things really do. We have people every day coming into our aging disability resource center at the health department with these same things. So we are running a mini version of this um, at the health department right now for our aging disability resource center. It's just a focused navigation center. Covenant House does this with the under 25 crowd. They're a focused navigation center. This would be a broad spectrum navigation center. But in functional zero, we break the community into unique groups. Veterans is the one that everyone likes to talk about. Functional zero is fairly achievable around veterans because there's so many resources available. Um, and so that's that's a great example of one that we could get to functional zero in a fairly timely manner. It's, it's always a challenge, but um, you know, then you have the other sections. Like most people, you don't have one medical problem. Most people don't have one instruction, they have multiples. So we recognize that part of the navigation center is that ebb and flow of getting them, you know, prioritizing which item is the most important first, and then getting them that treatment, getting the second piece, so it might be mental health, so that they can take the substance misuse, and then maybe they have a physical condition that they can't climb stairs, and we, we help address some of those things, and then they could be in a situation where it's, it's a better fit for the client. Thank you. I'm going to Saxon take this one. Hello. Uh, some of the site uh, selection criteria that we've considered with this site is, uh, is, is kind of indicative as we are kind of developing areas that we forested. And so some of the language like uh, the fire department uses is uh, fire-wise mitigation. And so removing all the flammable materials, the things that can really let fire really take hold. That, uh, the Bachelor Community Council was very... Um, we, I guess we talked about most of our meeting was about the preventative measures to avoid fires, other cold fires that could, you know, uh, branch off into the other parts nearby. There's a one-way road that goes out to the Bachelor community, one way in, one way out, and so um, that is heavily emphasized in our plan that you will see additional fire hydrants, fire suppression, and then mitigation measures like um, firewise uh, efforts. So. Um, that's a heavy emphasis that you'll see throughout the project planning. Um, operations will support additional patrols to avoid anything that uh, can lead to that and or uh, undesirable behaviors. Some of the elements of firewise mitigation also uh, gives a uh, line of sight to the supervisors that are patrolling that area. So you can see, say everything that hasn't been determined yet, somewhere between like eight, eight feet down on the tree line, so you can see long distances. And so we can really enforce that we don't want to let camps establish themselves because that's proven that that's where some of the uncontrolled fires have uh, taken off. So heavy emphasis on fire prevention that you'll see throughout the project plan. Yeah, site selection, uh, you know, we whittled it down. Well, the day company was hired to uh, find sites that were advantageous for such a build. It uh, came down to a purpose-built structure that's more advantageous. The cost, the unknown costs associated with renov renovations can quickly escalate. So to better control the costs and to better meet the needs of, the, of those that will benefit from the services, uh, we quickly uh, honed in on purpose-built tension membrane structure. Now we assumed it would be a tension membrane structure. We asked in the RFP left at big that the construction industry would, would provide a solution to our needs. So we left it pliable and flexible for contractors to provide a solution. And um, you know, it, 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 it confirmed what we thought it would go and uh, as far as what kind of building product would be provided and it's that membrane structure. And so uh, along those paths, we are seeking that solution and going down that road with the design and, and it seems to fit our needs and is, is on track and looking good. Those five sites, uh, the seven were whittled down to five, and then five were whittled down to two, and really when it came down to two was the tent development where there's the MOA some storage site near m and and then where it's currently located uh, now. And the big constraint is the PLI zoning. 
and um, and that's where we're here now for the conditional use uh, permit to comply with that process, and um, it sets us up for success. Yeah, the project design. I mean, early in the planning, you was you, you probably remember the APD evidence storage lot uh, to to your right up there. Uh, that is a project that was built in 2013, and so all the civil work, the idea was that all the civil work and all the substandard, you know, sub-material was already developed, it's all non cost susceptible, it would just be trenching for utilities, it's, it would help uh, expedite project delivery. Um, under, you know, when we really dug in after securing the construction manager and really brainstorming how to meet the timeline and get this uh, built, the cost was Cost was a big factor and timeline was a big factor. And connecting utilities, the utilities currently are at the left side near the EP and the storage building. And so those are long linear foot runs and there's a cost associated per linear foot. And so to get it all the way up to EP and the storage lot was close to 1.2 million. And so bringing it down to this lot in the middle helps uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, it avoids relocating APD, and relocating APD was was a pretty tough subject. Um, and adds more money and more time and disruption to operations to APD. Out of respect to them and, um, and, and saving costs and trying to make this timeline, uh, we, we found this their parking lot. And part of what helps us uh, you know, use this lot as a solution is APD's intended use of the administrative building has changed since they relocated downtown. And so, ironically, that building is being somewhat renovated for long-term evidence storage on the interior. And so, they don't have the formula for occupants to building space that they once had before. So, a lot of things kind of um, played in our favor to utilize this lot and meet a lot of our project goals. And then it saves a lot of, a lot of money and helps to meet the timeline. So, here's a conceptual um, kind of a uh, overhead view. Uh, drawings are getting better, you know, week by week now, but it kind of shows you an orientation of where the, uh, the building will lay. The interior floor plan um, accommodates a lot of stakeholder comments. Meg Saltel has been real uh, instrumental in, in making this a welcoming space. It's very critical that it's welcoming because if we want those that need these services to, to come here, we want to make it welcoming so they, you know, they feel comfortable they feel welcomed and to seek these services. One thing that this facility will do is uh, accommodate the administrative offices from the multiple entities that will um, you know, stage here and their office personnel will have an office that they can use. I mean, there's, Joe, correct me, there's other entities that want to be involved, but uh, they have to operate out of their other offices and have more of a mobile command remote feel instead of an on-site presence. Yeah, we've had a lot of agencies now that we've um, you know, gone forward and start to reach out that we didn't have kind of firm service from and now they're interested in getting into a uh, relationship. It's a lot of people donate services and a lot of their request is just to have space to leave equipment and stuff like that. So I think this is a great um, diagram that shows, you know, we have that space for this. And the idea being they can receive five or six or seven services at the same time. So, you know, the week days that they can come and get everything done at once which would be really beneficial for the clients. And all this drawing, this is, this is not the most current, just yesterday I believe we brought the bathrooms inside as one of the cost cutting measures to try to bring this in uh, to, to reach that goal, that financial goal was to, uh, earlier times you saw the uh, bathrooms and showers on their own outbuildings. Now we brought it into the building area, you see the rectangle between the administrative spaces and um, the open, open space and so we're the new plan you'll see the bathrooms and the showers line up um, along that linear section that the rectangle uh, shows there. So here's some of the projects. I don't make this has been on some of presentations um, from other successful places. Ironically, they use a sprung uh, product. And so the skylights are some of the accessories that you can order. And it really lends itself to some creative options for the interior to make it a real welcoming uh, place. All the alternatives that are being considered, you know, we're working real closely with DOT and there's heavy emphasis on controlling pedestrian traffic from this facility and to other adjacent services, 
keeping them out, you know, keeping everyone out of APA the storage lot, which is heavily secured for you know, so many reasons. And, and um and that you know it really channeling traffic towards the overpass it goes over the top of Tudor towards other services there. Uh, other elements are activating and, and, and currently obsolete bus transit stop along Tudor. And so along with a transportation plan that's being drafted as well to get get those that will benefit from services to other parts of town. And so uh, all all part of a plan that's taking shape right now with potentially one or multiple operators. Let's see where that lays. I want to talk a little bit about the what's next and the permitting that's required for this project. So I know we've kind of talked about this in some of our past meetings, but just as a reminder, we do have a conditional use permit process that we're going through now, and this is this community meeting is part of that process. We've also also been meeting with the community councils to give them updates um, and provide them the information as it becomes available. Along with that, we do have a wetlands permit modification. Uh, that little um, vegetated area that's to the south of the existing parking lot was originally permitted under the APD expansion project. Um, and we do have to amend that permit because this is a new project. But it was approved previously, and mitigation was paid um, as part of that permit. And then finally, we'll have a building permit that we need to obtain. Um, so this project will get reviewed just like any other development project in town um, through that building permit process. And then on the conditional use permit process, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this now, there's many opportunities to have community engagement and participation, uh, starting with the community meeting that we're having this evening. Um, when we make the submission to the municipality, you can submit written comments at that time that do become part of the staff packet that is reviewed by the Planning and Zoning Commission. And then, of course, at the hearing itself, uh, there is another opportunity for folks to testify about the project. So what's next is, of course, we're having our community meeting this evening. Um, we, would, we are planning on making our conditional use permit submittal uh, at the end of this month. Um, which would mean that we would have a conditional use permit hearing in August. Um, so that gives you an idea of the timeline. And then for, for you guys to be able to stay up to date on what's going on, you're always welcome to email the uh, project email, which is the MLA Navigation Center at L.com. Myself and other team members receive those emails. We are tracking them and making sure that they get to the appropriate parties within the municipality to be able to answer your questions. We also have a project web page that is live. Um, and then you can also go to the mayor's web page and there's a homelessness tab at the top, which will also provide you uh, information on the project. And then for those of you that are here this evening, there are QR codes at the back of the room and we do have cards that you can take with you that have an online survey um, that comes up as well. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to our presentation. And I, right now, we only have uh, one speaker in the room. Yeah. My name is Andrew Gray, and I live in Kimball Park. Um, my question is, I guess, to Mr. Joyce about. Um, all of the services that were provided at Elmore and Tudor, I guess my question is, um, are all of the services being provided at the cell event? And if not, why do it start? Well, a couple answers to that question. So most of the services are provided at the cell event. But to be clear, the cell event is not a homeless shelter. The cell event is a COVID-19 emergency response shelter. So it's a totally different animal. And we need to be clear on that. I've spoke to this for about the last eight months. It was stood up in under FEMA public assistance. It's not a homeless project. So the reason I know that is it's a clear delineation in, in responsibility while they look very similar. But uh, yes, we have a hub there, which would be that version of the navigation center. We allow providers to come out and be on the floor and meet the people where they are, and we provide those services. We have shuttle buses to medical. 
but it is not a place that, for instance, somebody could comes and goes. We, we don't have a um, substance misuse provider that's actively working with us there because there's just not the bandwidth in the city. So that's some of the stuff that the facilitated process does differently is it, it develops those other clients. We don't have a medically fragile provider right now. The Brother Francis shelter is not currently accepting new folks. So having the sockeye stand up. So while it's very close in, in operation, there are minute differences, but I think it goes back to the core. That was not stood up, and I need to keep saying this, was not stood up in response to homelessness. It was stood up in response to a COVID-19 emergency and has been operating as such for the last two years. And we, while very closely related, we have to be careful that it, it provides services to everybody. Um, it was, and you know, if you were there in the beginning, and I've been in there for the last two years, um, we had fishermen that came up to fish and didn't have a place to go and they didn't have the resources to get home. The boat decided not to go out and they had driven all the way up here, flown up here from somewhere to work. So that was kind of a different situation than we're looking at Cougar and Elmore, which is addressing that root cause, which is abating people losing their apartment or, or trying to keep people in their place. I, I think people think of the folks that stand at, you know, New Sword and, and that, that's one piece of the population that the navigation center serves, but it serves that family that, you know, maybe dad got hurt at work and can't work and they're about to lose their place. That is also the people we're going to serve. So we constantly hear about, you know, single male shelter, and that's one tiny piece of the overall operation of the NAV center. And that would be different than what you have at this whole thing right now. Sure. Thank you. I have just one comment, and that is that Campbell Park Community Council has their meeting tonight, and we were looking forward to having a presentation from Dell and having a discussion about the navigation center since the navigation center will be located within Campbell Park. Um, we were looking forward to our first presentation, which was scheduled in June 2021, and that was to be given by John Morris, but he no showed. And tonight, you guys won't be there because you double booked. And this is who you're here for. But if this was the Campbell Park Community Council, this isn't enough people to be quorum. We would have to cancel our community council. We'd never cancel our community council to be quorum. But this is not enough people. And my feeling is, is that this was not advertised, and this is a very small group of people, and Campbell Park is again just getting the shit. They're just not respected. And it just happens again and again and again. And I really wish you guys would come to Campbell Park Community Council and not tell us the last day. I wouldn't know that this was happening if I hadn't been added by the chair to an email chain. So thanks to uh, Portia Erickson, I found out about this meeting tonight because I got on that chain. I don't know how the other people found out, but it was very difficult to find out online. And so um, I shouldn't take things personally, but man, I take it personally. I really wish you guys would come to Campbell Park where you're going to put this. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, Andrew, as we spoke earlier today, I'm more than happy to set up a meeting with the community council in June or July. And I do apologize that this is only my mistake on the timing of this meeting relative to the community council, and I do apologize for that. Um, but we do want to make sure that we come and see you all. Okay, our next speaker is speaker number two, James. I think this is the last one. Yeah. Hello, how's it going tonight? Hey, thanks a lot for being here, everybody. Um, uh, my name is James. I'm a resident and business owner in Fairview. I also um, am a member at large with the Community Council, as well as with the Fairview Business Association, and the chair of the Homelessness Ad Hoc Committee, which was started because of the, uh, the Sullivan Ring and, um, of course, in response to the COVID pandemic, what we did to you know, um, keep people alive over the winter, winter months and all the challenges that we've had. So, bear with me here. I'm not used to doing this, but um, I would be remiss if I did not. So. Um, I do appreciate the comments made and all the work you guys are all doing um, on this really challenging issue. Functional zero, obviously, in, in a perfect world, we all want to see that. That's not going to happen. Um, which is why we're stuck with this huge challenge that we're trying to figure out uh, with limited resources and, um, and summer's gone, right? Fish. Um, so, a few questions. Um, we were um, able to do a tour of the Salt and Rain, which was um, very high yielding, and um, that's why I wanted to ask a few questions. And I was really glad to hear that the bathrooms are going to be more 
Los Angeles. We located a new facility that's excellent, and hopefully we'll be, you know, fixing some things that might have been an issue with that, um, that overextension there, and be able to get everyone, um, keep everyone under roof. So um, my first question is, and I don't know if I have time to do it, but um, uh, mentally challenged people or people that are sick. So I'm right on 15th Avenue, the old Billy's Cedar Shop. So a lot of my customers are people that live at the arena as well as um, people that are just uh, placed in services in the area. And so I know a lot of them personally, and um, you know, um, we work with their challenges every day on the street. I do personally, and I have a lot of empathy. We're all here to to try to make this work and figure out something and be compassionate. So a lot of people really mentally challenged. I just have to say that we have 25 beds at API last time I was told, and um, it's not long term. So you know, one question, and I don't know if you want to write these down as they go, or I should just stop after each one. Um, but you know, what do we do with people that are really mentally in need of services and we don't have those services. So what happens then? And I'll just piggyback that right on to, you know, fairly a lot of the a lot of the residents right around Sullivan Arena are, are so, you know, at their wits end, they don't they won't believe anything anyone says and they don't really won't say anything but you guys know some of just been individuals and when they're ready to move, of course they can't get any value out of their properties because of what's going on. And you know, in a perfect world it would be really high value properties that could be, you know, restaurants and bars and really cool things that we could all enjoy. It's all great. So, what their fear is is that people are going to continue to come back and spend time in these areas, and, and um, you know, all of them. They're all on a personal basis with APD. It's a high, um, a high, um, a high cost for the city. And uh, so, of course, I want to know what's going to keep troubled individuals from coming back to Fairview in the areas where they're used to being, the services, and of course, beans and other types. All these great, these great services. Um, we're all concerned about that um, because you know we could set up a navigation center, but you can't keep people from going back. Um, and, you know, obviously we're going to continue that service as a very good, understand that, uh, but we're also really invested in what happens with people because we care about them. We're not just, hey, they're going to be in another neighborhood, we don't care anymore. We actually care a lot. A lot of people do. It's not just about placing them outside. So we're curious about that. The mentally ill, um, if there's any sort of bigger plan there, what's going to keep people from coming back? Troubled individual plan. I really would like to hear more about that. And that's not coming from me, that's coming from people that have come to us and that have said there's no plan for the trouble individuals. They won't be housed. They're going to go in the woods until it becomes fall, and then what happens? What's the plan there? I don't know what it is. I can't come up with anything. I think about it all the time, and I don't know what to do about it, as a lot of people don't. And we're just going to push the problem you know, around. And I just would, would love to hear a plan for the trouble individuals. You know, Anchorage is a place where a lot of people come and they land here and they're stuck. Any number of reasons, you know. And they're also coupled in, you know, with a lot of people that just need that help they can to get up there. So, yeah, hey James, uh, as we go up, um, Bill Matt answer the technical stuff, but you're the kind of the expert in the local area. If if we move them to a nav center in um, Elmore uh, Tudor, why would they come back? Is there some other why would they come back to that area? Is, is there something that they value there? I mean, I mean if the Salt Marine is just back. Popular concerts. Sure. sure. Well, that's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of wooded areas around, as well as the direct line down the corridor. There's also an area that's in development right now um, to Brother Francis Beans, a lot of the other services that already exist there. So we're talking about people that have connections with each other. Like you guys see them, we all know the faces, right? You see them all around town. They all centralize really from our area. They spread out. So it's an issue that all of us deal with. But I, the only answer I have to you is your, your question, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Is um, I feel like they have they have a sense of place in Fairview. I mean, I know they do. I talk to them all the time. I feel like they come off property, you know, next door because of how much trash we're dealing with on a daily basis. Which, again, I just think that the sense of community. I don't know what's around Tudor. I know a lot of people are potentially not going to want the same thing we deal with. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just was wondering. Who, we're looking for you know causes and effects, and if, sure. if there was some other additional thing you sense, you seem to say it's a sense of community or, or belonging. We do know that uh, if, if there's such a thing, the science of homelessness, but folks radiate at about a 10 block radius um, from where the bed is. Where do we put the bed for them? And it's about a 10 block radius. Now, if you give them free bus rides, that that radius gets rather extreme. We've got people in Huffman. And, all over town, Eagle River, and, and that's because, quite frankly, we had a policy where they 
they either got free bus rides or that or the bus pass issue wasn't of course we're we're doing that now it's just no no fair no right um and and it's because we need to one get our buses back to us so on the technical stuff though i think joe can uh can answer that thank you very much well james you hit it right on the head um you know, it's, it's not a single item. I like to say multifaceted, but that's just words. But what, I, what you just talked about is exactly the beginning of the solution. You meet them where they are, and you have a binding relationship. And that's exactly what we're doing. The second piece, I think, dropping back a little bit, you look at the progressive step the city took with the alcohol tax and what that then allows us to do from the NCT to all the things. And so the higher level, you know, in, in Alaska, the Mental Health Trust um, is the person duty bound for a lot of those recipients' care. You're right, API, you know, overall in the last 10 years, we shrank from over 200 mental health beds down to the 25. Com complication is that API has had some struggles. It's not it's a state agency. Uh, it's been hard to retain providers and my staff, uh, high assault rate, huge worker comp rates. So we're, we're working with them on that too. But you're dead on. I think the key though that, that wasn't mentioned and I think is very relevant is that you're talking about this this camaraderie they have and that's the piece that getting them anchored to a home gives them. So I think when you're talking about that's the housing piece, right? And and that's we we realize that that keeps people from going because we can find a place to put that 75 year old that maybe has some medical conditions at a radically fragile facility. But they can't take their 25 year old nephew that came with them to support them, right? they're not that's not the piece that's available there so having some place in a housing situation then that also brings over these large extended families and while they may not make sense to us to them they make perfect sense whether they're from the same village they served in the same unit or they're from the same court um or whatever piece of texas that's the piece that they really need that anchored home for because it allows them to have a place that's not outside your business to keep them from coming back, you know, that's a challenge anywhere. I think every city faces this, whether it's bars letting out at 2 or 4 a.m. or a loud club or the homeless, you know. The piece that really handicaps us at the Sully is that it was designed for hockey. Um, and, you know, it's not, it would be the last place if I was normally opening a shelter, which is what I do, that I would look at. You know, it doesn't have windows, it's kind of dreary inside, and just that keeping the mental health of people up by having sunshine during Look how beautiful it is today, probably one of the things affecting us also, in addition to what Mr. Gray noted. Um, this is it. And so those things, making the NAV Center a place to talk about that, that's the day engagement piece. So hopefully instead of being in your neighborhood or, or at least causing trouble in your neighborhood, we have a place where we can get them the services they need, like the mental health you're talking about. Um, whether it be they have uh, you know some kind of severe pain problem because of their foot, well, let's get their foot. It might be as simple as a good pair of shoes so they can walk around without that irritating pain we all have had one. So I think you hit it right on the head though, but it's gonna be the, nobody uh, goes out and has one problem. They have high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. We address all of them. And the same thing here, we need to address them. And I'll go ahead and let you ask your next questions. Is there gonna be a health clinic inside the NAV Center this time? Absolutely. Awesome. And, and we have health services now at the at the Sully. Um, you know, that was another struggle at the Sully, for instance. We had Anchor Shane with the health center and their Dr. Brockow was coming down. And it just wasn't really conducive to providing medical treatment in the old locker room. And so we have uh, many, uh, if the map is up, we have many treatment rooms. And they're not just medical, they can be for a mental health consultation or um, you know, podiatry and all those kind of things that lead to a better overall health. Can you expand on why that wasn't um, effective? Was it, was it, it wasn't just resources or cost because there was a little bit of a, um, are we talking about the, med the medical provider? Well, it had nothing to do with cost. Well, they did that. So one of the things they realized was, you got to remember too, this goes back to the intent of the shelter, which was a COVID response shelter. And in that in that situation, what happened was when Anchorage Neighborhood Health Center reopened, it's easier to have all the related services because we need to order labs and x-rays and all the things that you encounter when you go to a medical provider. Very few medical things are just a straight, we take a look and cut you a script, right? So we need to at least draw your blood. So not having those services there, but a provider there was a challenge. Um, and then I think the piece that you saw, it just happens to be tr transitioned out at the same time that the world kind of started to reopen. So we had the bus that comes six times a day from Native alone. 
Um, the bus comes from Anchorage Neighborhood Health Center almost hourly. They have a customized people mover, uh, sorry, uh, uh, anchor rides bus that comes. So those injuries started. So I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't related. Uh, there was the struggles just operating a shelter and keeping control of the locker room. You don't have a waiting area. You don't have an area where you see somebody to set aside while you order other work or get that lab work done. So it was more conducive. They have a pharmacy on site, x ray lab, getting back to Anchorage Neighborhood, which is our community, our federally funded community health center in Anchorage. And then um, on the IHS side, we have the Alaska Data Medical Center. So that's really what happened. Those services reopened, kind of not negating, but reducing the need at the Sully Center. Gotcha. Thank you so much. I'll try to get through this quickly. Um, so you mentioned substance abuse, another thing that we deal with a lot of. Um, in our neighborhood. And by the way, I just wanted to clarify that yes, I have a business there, but I will say here on behalf of the residents and the longtime business owners in Fairview. And my, my role is um, the, the chair of the ad hoc committee, um, mainly just speaking for people and what they've said. So what we've heard about in our prior services. Um, substance abuse. So you mentioned people needing beds because of detoxing. So prior in the emergency services, those people detoxes, uh, those detoxes didn't really have a place to go, and in a lot of cases, they had to go to the woods and use again. Um, and I would just like to hear what's changed in the plan that, that we have more constructive. I mean, obviously, if we can't find uh, beds for people that are, that are you know, that have done atrocious things, but not been fit to, uh, to stay at trial, and then they're released after they've done horrendous things that should be in prison for, for a decade. I would like to hear as well, like, what is the plan for those that are detoxing, they're sick, they, they have no other option but to leave, go to the woods. In fact, I've even heard some of you know, they can just go back to the woods. Um, you know, I know that's not necessarily in anyone's room, but I've heard that that was a, a thing that was actually said that people should just you know, go back to where they were camping. So, um, again, I just would like to hear it. We're, it's such a challenge for beds and resources. What are we going to do for those that, that are trying to get off drugs? Great question. Um, you know, there's a scale of uh, resources around um, what, what you call drug addiction, we like to call substance misuse or substance abuse. So in that spectrum, um, you know, very rapidly, we're going to have the 660 facility from Salvation Army that has 68 uh, long-term care beds coming back on. That building is heavily damaged during the earthquake. Um, Salvation Army didn't find street for funding. Uh, the state and the municipality now have stepped in to repair that building pretty substantially damaged during the 18 earthquake. And that building will be online by November. So that's a great example of we will now have an avenue to navigate somebody to. Now that's pretty significant. That's what we call 3.5 beds. So what I mean by that is there's 3.1. Anything in a three is a medically monitored bed. And it's not just you're somewhere where they don't watch you. So there's three ones, three threes, three fives, and then four would be the kind of what I, for lack of a better term, I'm not advocating, that would be what you would call a lockdown ward in a normal hospital where, you know, you have to be released and um, we don't have that in Anchorage and that's one of the challenges. Um, we are working with providers, particularly the state, because that they are the ones that are duty bound to provide those under the law. So, but in Anchorage, the, the top care, a three, five bed, we will have at 660, we call it 660, it was on the map. And that's the Salvation Army facility that has been operating down there for many years, was really well received by the community down there. I don't think you ever heard anything negative around 660, and they're ready to come back online. In addition to that, we have housed with the Salvation Army. Um, the annex reopened today, which is 12 treatment beds for females only. It's a female only facility. So we brought that back online in partnership through some funding and helping the Salvation Army bring those beds back on. They went live today and they're starting to fill those beds tomorrow. So, I mean, right there is about 75-ish beds that we have uh, coming online in the next, you know, three to six months, immediately over six months. Thank you. That's a great start. Thank you. Um, there's obviously a gap between the June 30th or whatever the new projected, if, if there is one, the June 30th date and the November date that's been brought up as what's going to happen in between. Um, and then uh, that's Great news, you're going to be providing transportation, I assume, or an agency will be. Fantastic. And then just a quick side note. No, but I, I don't want to stop you, but on transportation, it's multifold. It's not it's not giving out bus passes and putting people on buses to ride around the system, right? It is getting to the services they need. That's the navigation piece. We had a contract for transportation at the Solar, and we had three vans covering the entire transfer 12, 24 7. 
as things start to reopen, that became less necessary also. Um, we are going to have the community providers that we have now that have their shuttle buses, whether it's South Central, uh, ATHC, whether it's uh, Anchor Shimba Health Center, and other places, Prob has buses. You know, we're located, the one nice piece is that historically right now, the Sullivan, over 60% of those guests are IHS beneficiaries. So, I mean, if I was going to pick a shelter somewhere, if the bulk of my, my clients, like your business, I'm going to be where the clients need to be. And I know it seems like an unusual place, but when you have over 60% of the guests are you know, eligible for services there, that would be the place to be. If we had 60% military, I would have advocated it being close to the VA facility out on Bellevue. But this is just the re reality of the situation here. And so um, but that's the answer on transportation. SACS didn't answer the timeline, but I want to say in general, one of the the real blessings of this passing is we can now start setting those hard timelines. We have forecasts before now. Saxton's at 35% of planning. Now we can go into the details, but getting that hard date really allows us to start setting those timelines firmly. Are those beds 100% locked in, or is there any other hurdle that you might see that might make them not available for the, uh, the substance abuse? Oh, no, the Salvation Army is moving as quick as they can. If somebody wanted to go public process, it is a uh, operating facility that will be returning, so um, no, it is. Uh, it has been down there and operating as a treatment center. It did more things. It's actually not reopening fully. They had a bunch of uh, job training on site that's currently not coming back. But um, that has been a standing facility for many, many years and operated with, with absolutely, the community loved them because it used to provide um, skilled labor for the folks in that community. There's a lot of warehouses down there, and they love them for warehouse workers and stuff. Salvation Army ran a very um, um, great program. I can't even say good, it's great, because they would modern, they fed them, they had uh, a jobs for them, and it really helped them that transition. That's that navigation piece. I think we all want to work and be useful and helpful, and that really helps give you some sense of a uh, path forward. It's yeah, actually a lot of folks that they're doing actually that are getting jobs uh, with the uh, with nine. It's so right. really cool. Oh, I'll add before I talk about the transition. Um, but there's also the pillar for workforce housing, and that comes next down the line. Larry Baker, who would speak to that in fact, he spoke about that in other presentations. So that's something to look forward to in the next steps. Um, so that's exciting as you talked about everyone getting jobs and, and growing. And, and this is the municipalities, you know, taking. Um, taking this problem on head on. In 2018, it was the first time the municipality uh, contributed funds towards the governor and house. It started to identify the, those uh, nonprofit services that had been pitching in for so long with no con contribution from public funding. And so this is really elevating the, you know, the municipality's efforts towards attacking the problem and helping those that, you know, these are our friends, these are our neighbors, these are people that we've grown up with and live with. So. You know, we I travel around the state working on construction projects all around the state. It's these are our, you know, these are our local Alaskans, regardless for the most part, you know. So, um, as far as the transition you talked about, the Megs all tell the um, Anchorage uh, Coalition and Homelessness has really been a big piece of this is, is, is identifying these um, uh, resources outside of the Sullivan to help draw down that population and that need at that location to help with the transition. And so, you know, there's multiple facilities that are accommodating these individuals, and that never changes day to day. There's, there's everyone, each department has their own goals, each entity has their own goal to um, allocate people elsewhere. Part of that is identifying, you know, what services do you need most, and then placing those there. And then, you know, obviously when the navigation center comes on, that, that's the exciting part that Joe's talking about, is identifying those challenges that those, you know, helping them identify those challenges, identify some goals, and helping them reach those milestones one after another. Now that, that, that's a big piece that comes on with the operators and, and, and all that and their strengths. But uh, that transition piece before the navigation center comes online is a, is a big piece right now. How about that gap, that July, that let's say June, July to November, I know a lot of people are curious about that. Yeah, that, that it, the nice thing about the CMGC work with the contractors, we started ordering materials, everything that, you know, these pieces come together uh, this can, you know, the reason we're here for the conditional use permit, it's a big project constraint. Um, that schedule that, that, you know, probably the last current schedule that you see on the website, we're, we're hoping to um, condense that. You know, it does paint a, you know, it, it's, it's not a great picture right now. Sure. But I'd rather be real. I'd rather be real and under deliver. So, yes. 
started what I mean, but we're, we're just all curious. I'm sure a lot of people did. Is, you know, what happens in between because uh, people are in and out of your of your typical navigation center or, or uh, emergency uh, shelter in and out to you know, being you know, uh, regulations or, or you know uh, or just you know not eating sort of, or camping or they'll be in and out. So what happens in the meantime when they don't have the, the arena or I think there was you know, shrinking substantial timelines. Nobody really knows we're doing all the best we can here to push more as fast as possible. I know a lot of people working on this, so I appreciate that. But we're just always wondering, you know, about the people that don't get to get housed to get in trouble individuals if there is a sort of a sense of what's gonna happen in between if there is a gap or there won't be either a navigation center or an emergency shelter. No, I, I think that's a great question. As constantly talked about in, in, in our meetings, the planning with the designers and everybody, so I'll let Joe speak to So that, that's a great question. I actually heard two questions there, if, if I'm being correct. You asked, is it shutting down? And are we, I mean, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read between the lines and assume your question is, are we shutting down and streaming people? The answer is no. Then you have a second question about the people that refuse to be navigated. And I think every homeless system faces this. You break them into a pie and you start looking. There's the people that are easily placed, the people that are working that just need a little support, all the way down to the people with complex mental health and medical conditions that need the 15 steps versus one to be in a permanent solution. The first answer is, as you're aware, the, the medically fragile folks can go up to the SOC high end, which will open June 6th. So a lot of those intensive cases will be able to start going to the SOC high end. Brother Francis then will be able to be decompressed and will be able to move people back into Brother Francis well below the prior cap. Then you have the piece of the guest house, which is workforce house, 131 rooms in the guest house. And that is going to provide all those working folks that you referred to a place. The commitment from the coalition, and they've been working very diligently to meet, is 10 placements a day. And um, that is a super big lift. I mean, just doing the math, if we were doing 10 a day, it shows you get up to the solve of it. But you have people that um, haven't navigated. And one of the things that's now prompting these folks is that they have a clear end date. Um, you know, and then, uh, again, we are going to keep them. We have the aviator still operating, the owner of the aviator. Had originally said we need the aviator to go back to summer um, you know, tourist housing, and he is not going to do that. They are not going to do that as a group of people. And they actually have offered some to use housing vouchers. It's a little more complex than hotel rooms because you have to have a kitchenette and a sink outside of the bathroom, a mini kitchen, for lack of a better term. So we're looking at, the, at those kind of properties like the guest house that has suite rooms, what you would call a suite, um, where they can actually have a cooking can qualify for housing vouchers. So um, we continue the facilitated process, which is, you know, we're out there looking for places, whether it be working with apartment owners like Widener Homes, or looking for buildings that we can have Rasmus and purchase um, in partnership with the city. It's been a public-private partnership. So those things are all in play, but, but I know that 30th date is a little scary because it looks like they're gonna come back at July 1st and the door's locked. That's not it. We are not intending to you know, we don't sound the fire alarm and dump the building on July 1st at 8 a.m. That is not the plan. The plan is to transition these folks, as many as we can, to permanent situations. That permanent situation may be, um, you know, treatment. That permanent situation may just be workforce housing. We have a ton of folks that actually work, but, they, you know, I think everyone in this room knows that our property values and rents are crazy. A studio goes for twelve or $1,500. Try to get a two-bedroom place, it could be two grand. And that's a challenge. Um, you know, we're using those emergency rental assistance dollars. For instance, we have a um, the purchasing department. We're releasing a, a updated plan tomorrow to continue not just to support the people of the Sullivan, but the entire municipality. Um, that's why the mayor vetoed that 900k was to make sure it served the entire community, not just the folks at the Sullivan. Because we know it's great that we're helping those folks there, but we don't want people to enter the system because we were so laser focused over here that we didn't see that person who. Maybe their charter boat isn't going to run this year and they need that assistance. We're here for all of the community and the homeless are part of our community. Okay, thank you very much. And we just look forward to seeing uh, some resources on that in the gap period so that you know, it doesn't increase the, uh, the impact of, uh, of really the, the crisis uh, that we're facing right now. And also, you know, with the price of everything going up and you know, people talking about things getting worse before they get better, I do appreciate you guys talking about the resources you're going to put into this because it's getting hard for all of us every day. So, um, quick question, uh, does anyone know who, what agency it is that uh, DB cases get um, submitted to? So, like, if, if only 
it and comes in and she's been assaulted or, or been in a really challenging situation, she needs uh, domestic violence services. Um, prior to this at the Sullivan Arena, the agency handling TV cases took zero cases from them. So the people were not allowed to have, uh, entry into, which I should, I was not prepared for this, I apologize. But uh, the, a lot of the agencies uh, haven't really been, and I know it's probably extended resources, but for instance, social workers are obviously overlooked because they never once you know, made it to the Sullivan Arena or been able to, people can't find their caseworkers, they're not contacting them, they're not answering their phone. So those are the kind of challenges that we are facing now, which is if you've been a victim of domestic violence, you can't get help if you're at the soul of the arena. If, if you have a social worker, there's a chance that that social worker's, you know, so overwhelmed they can't reach out to you and you can't get your services. And again, this is coming directly from, you know, the, uh, the agencies uh, running the, the, uh, the soul of the arena. So um, I think that the, uh, it would be great to see a little bit more proactive work there. Uh, whatever we need to do, I know everyone. Well, you hit one of the biggest challenges. You know, social workers have been a critical shortage, probably more than doctors and nurses. Um, you know, the difference is that when you look at the spectrum of opportunities, um, a lot of social workers don't have the interest in being in some situations. So we use lay workers and you, you asked about the Sullivan. We've had a contract there um, for this entire time since the health department took it over. We have a $4.2 million contract for intensive case management that we pay out to social services to provide that intensive case management. I hear you say they're not there. They never came to us. They haven't been. I was there with them. So I'm not going to I'm not going to debate with you. I heard this. Could we always do better? Absolutely. But I can tell you that they gave out over $180,000 in support money just last month, and it historically has been a quarter million a month. So they use that money to manage those cases, and that money isn't for them, it goes to the client. So if they weren't providing the casework, the client wouldn't qualify for the funds that we have the health department. We actually write that check. Um, so they put them, they queue them up, and then we make the payment. So could it be better? Yes. Are they understaffed? Absolutely, just like everyone. Um, they, the contract calls for 12 caseworkers, and they're hovering seven, eight. Um, you know, and the other part is that the clients themselves, um, you know, based on all the challenges that you identify, you start somebody down the road of case management, you start having meetings, and they miss one, and they miss two, and you know, they go on to the next one because they are managing a huge caseload. But um, you know, MSWs, we have three on staff at the MOA, and we're down one right now. So we actually provide that service. We have actual MSWs that do intensive case management around homelessness. They're actually based right here at the, uh, and so we meet them where they are. We have quite a large homeless population here. So we have city municipal um, social workers right here at the library. I apologize that didn't mean that's a no, no, no. I obviously just spoke. Um, there's obviously a lot going on, a lot of back and forth, and what I heard may not have been 100% true. But what I did hear is, is that a lot of the agencies just didn't visit. So. For me personally, getting my hands on something, seeing it, everything is how I you know, manage my business, and uh, not how everyone does. So it's important to see, you know, see it here. So um, can we just get through the rest of the yeah, we can. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, have one other person. We have one person who's been waiting. waiting. If you wouldn't mind letting them have some time, and then we can always come back to you. Sure. Yeah, I think honestly, the only other thing I have is the uh, facility cleaning, just to hear about the deep cleans and how you're going to facilitate those. Thank you. Are you talking about the facility? Uh, just in general, uh, so for, for deep cleanings. Uh, at, at the navigation center, is that what the new navigation center? We so that is a, to talk about that. the separate RFP is going to go out for that. So to we're going to have a cleaning crew that's daily, weekly, monthly. It's medically driven. It's going to be sanitation. We're building that into the plant with Saxton from the get-go. For instance, the bathrooms have the ability that we can go in there in an emergency and hose it out with a hose. They're going to be floor to ceiling hose, what we've learned from situations in Seattle and San Francisco and other places. So we've built that all into the plan. So that's a great question. But what we've learned from the Sullivan was the original answer of the Sullivan was an all-in-one contract. And that's really complex. Then we gave out 46 contracts when we went to 99 plus 1. We've now realized a hybrid version where you provide all the client services, but maybe we have a cleaning contractor that provides that and cleaning the kitchen. And then we have a janitorial service, like a normal business would have, where you know, you're 
employees, you probably don't clean it, right? You have somebody come in at a school is a great example. So that's the format that we're using, like the school uh, around the navigation center through the RFP process through purchasing. Okay, thank you. That affects all of us because people go into the, uh, into the community and with COVID is still a very real thing. So thank you very much for your time and information and uh, uh, criteria for entry. That was another one I had, but I imagine it's all probably on the website. So uh, thank you guys so much. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Um, can you see me, please? Oh, I'm I'm Stephen Callahan. I live about two blocks from the rescue mission in the UMED area. And uh, since I live in the UMED area, it's basically going on. Uh, and with their on the Adam and Apple instead. However, I'm afraid the only thing they feel anyway. So I might as well accept their happen here. <clears throat> Rather than stand here and yell for endless amount of time with the science. Um I do have a few questions that have come up. Um, the uh, one of the big concerns we've had in the community is uh, what's going to happen, I guess, outside the facility and outside the site. You know, what, what's the community mitigation? And to give you an example of what happens at the rescue mission, a lot of times in the winter, almost year round, there are now people like Lyme that get in. <laughs> Once they meet the maximum number of people that can enter that facility, these, they get cut off. So now these people, Pretty warm around the neighborhood. They end up places like Holford Park, Kimber Creek, they have camp out. So I, one of the questions I think is, is what, what's going to, how's that going to work in this facility? Is it, this is going to be over 24 hours a day, can we be able to come and go as they please? Um, and, and it, it's, how, how's that, um, what is the details of how it's going to work? So I guess the first thing, I, I'm not going to correct you, but it's, it will be open 24 hours a day. The come and go piece is not a true statement. You don't allow come and go at, at the Sullivan. We have quiet hours to not disrupt people in there. So um, the difference being, unlike what Beans did before, where they would at 7 or 8 in the morning put everyone on the street to sanitize the building, that will not occur. But um, the, the facility is located in a place that lessens that impact. As you see, there's actually quite a lot of land around there. So as they were to line up, if there was a rush, but being as open and receives people, um, and they'll be pre-checked in. So what I'm saying is once they've gotten on the list, they'll be able to come up and say, hi, I'm Bob. I stayed here before. I'm in need of services today. We pull Bob up, his, his picture's on the computer. Is that ID or not? We do a quick look at his bag like we do at the Sullivan to prevent the machete or you know, samurai sword from coming in and gets stored safely. Then we admit him to the facility. And that's the, the operating there. I, that is the challenge around some of the other missions because of the operating hours or the parameters, but you don't see a line outside of Covenant House, for instance. And that's the kind of footprint that we're really trying to copy. Um, that footprint down there, I understand they, they serve a niche community, but you know, a bulk of homeless is under 25. So they actually have a huge lift here. The big piece of homelessness is under 25 and seniors that have you know a lot of ancillary kind of problems besides the homelessness um, you know, the medical condition. So the answer is we're going to be receiving them where they are and getting the services. And that's the building, the real beauty of that building, despite it being close to your neighborhood, is that they can come in and get those services, whether it's a hot meal, whether it's navigated to medical care, so they don't end up camping in the in the park next to your, uh, your neighborhood. I, would, I can also add that um, you know, it is a heavy emphasis um, with the pedestrian traffic leaving the navigation center going out to Tudor, and, and there's a huge dedicated effort with the design team in our point of contact with the state of Alaska as a designated safety personnel uh, point of contact. Uh, Scott Thomas is his name, and he is uh, he brings continuity from years of planning, traffic assessments, and the whole history of vehicle versus pedestrian accidents around all of Anchorage, but Tudor has a special emphasis related to, you know, its history. And so 
that location with the mission is is a focal point. And so it, it is a huge emphasis in that project design to make sure that we, we mitigate that risk uh, to pedestrians. So right. and that's that is one of the concerns of the neighborhood is the fact that Peter and Ray has an unusually large number of pedestrian passes in at least half hour social media people. Right. Okay. So he he's been arguing about me we talked about this that we can look at this. Now one of the fact that recipes are located on the corner of Tudor and Wright Street contributes to that people run across the street going to the quickie mark. I don't know. <laughs> but perhaps um, something could be done or something should be considered, you know, if you plan to have more people to a film. I realize there's a bit of overpass and there's one here that are back in the third century line. But uh, we, uh, you know, we are concerned about people running across to uh, you know, we do a lot of testing, usually a large number of just pedestrian guests in the corner of two rivers. Um, now, the uh, building, there was some discussion over this being a two year use, like the navigation center. The, well, the building's going to be like multi use. You'll have an area where people are sleeping, you have an area for people to congregate, kind of like the coffee, you know, cafeteria slash coffee house style area. I paper virtually like a day room at a university yeah. dormitory, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you can go down and all hang out. And, Right. Yes, get some sweet, salty snacks, you know, that kind of thing. Rewarm, get a hot cup of coffee. So, yes, just like the picture shows, essentially a third of the building is dedicated to resources around the navigation piece. A third of it is day engagements, the term they like to use. Um, that would be the day room or the, the, the Greek meat area. And then you have the dormitory, which you see up there, which is limited to 150. The intent is based on the um, uh, assembly's um, AO, is to get the dormitory piece to be unnecessary thanks to functional zero within two years. Okay. And so the building will continue to operate with the social service side um, and the day engagement piece, but then we could have that dorm for other uses. That's the two year. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Is it, is it more or is it that it's going to be used for something else? Actually, essentially. I, no, that's great. And I appreciate the question because I think the best way to, to James's point is to just take some of these misunderstandings head on. You know, um, and so that's one of them is that this is always going to be involved. I, somebody mentioned, I think, casually, but this really we talked about being storage for emergency response supplies or being a place when we had another earthquake. Instead, we opened the in center during the 18 earthquake for we had a bunch of damaged buildings and garlic manor and stuff, right? So this would give us that response capability down the road. We were trying to show that we're not spending $10 million on a building that's going to get mall fall and we're going to lock the doors and walk away in two years. The city absolutely does not have the bandwidth on the emergency management side and this piece, just as an example of a possible use. Gotcha. Okay. All right, now along to the road, we have Tudor Road, Hospital, we have uh, Eight guys stuck back there. Uh, we also have uh, Jerry Turner, the Lord Turner facility, that's a modern church facility, the Eastside facility, 660, the Salvation Army facility. Uh, we have Jeff Morgan. We have another South Central Foundation building popping up uh, down there by Old Seward and Uter. Jim Rose almost turning into like the behavioral health court for our behaviors. I mean, uh, it seems like we're going to really start with the packet with a lot of facility centers. I mean, they got to go somewhere to understand that. But you know, there still will be issues. I've taken the bus around town. There's still issues with people taking the bus, you know, more people taking the bus up and down to the road. You know, um, I guess some will get a year around and pass the road. Um, so, you know, there's so many people wandering around outside of that 10-block radius. Um, and uh, are you going to have, like, 24-hour transportation to take people to this facility? Is that the plan for me? I don't want to speak for a group that's been empowered to deal with that. So 
what we've done is we've built a, a, a team of people, uh, you know, a board of people from all different walks of life, and that team is going to decide those kind of things. So I, I, I'm not trying to be elusive here, but we've talked about this at these meetings. That, you know, exactly who's going to be the provider sitting in room 103 to look at the B? I don't know. What, you know, and so the same here, the answer is yes, we're going to have a transportation plan. 24 hour, I don't know. I don't know that, you know, many communities, bigger ones even run buses that late. I mean, even Seattle runs a bus up and down Aurora, and that's it. You can't get out to Issaquah on the bus at 2 a.m. It's a giant metroplex. So, yes, we're going to have services. Yes, we'll have a way to get them there. That might be when we use our voucher program. So if it's 11 o'clock, we get a call that somebody, you know, APD drops people regularly when they come across them, when they provide that customer service. Of, you know, they, they know that the best thing would be, they don't want them to wait on a cab out there or a voucher, so they put them in an APD car and get them to us. We meet them where they are, and that's gonna be the piece. And I think having that day engagement piece um, really does help allay that, because that's what we're missing right now in Anchorage, is there's no place to go. They want to, they want to sanitize Brother Francis today, and they put everyone out. That was their normal operations, right? Was, at a certain time, they needed to move to the daily clean, and it's kind of like the military, where they, you know, the lights came on and you clear out the, the barracks and we go to, you know, clean it. Well, that's not what we're going to do. We have the day engagement piece, so we can have some form of that. But people are asking, like, what time are the lights coming on? That's to be decided by this multifaceted board in partnership with our subject matter expert from another navigation center. The requirement is to have three years of navigation center uh, experience to be the SME. So that's what we're looking for. This isn't someone that said, I know about navigation centers. This is somebody that has operated one. If they can't come here, they'll be a, um, you know, uh, I don't want to call it telemed, but they would be available under contract. There was, if we had a situation when there was meetings, they would attend digitally. We hope to have it. Best case scenario, we hope to have someone relocate to here to support that operation. But we know that's a big lift, particularly because of the two-year plan for that center. So some people may not want to upgrade their life. If they have a history of being in the biz, they can provide us be our subject matter expert and a true subject matter expert. So we will go out and look for that as part of the process. That'll be a requirement, for instance, of the operator to engage that. That'll be in the RFP say you must engage somebody with three year or more of navigation center operations experience. So that's how we'll address that. People keep asking how the city's not hiring a NAV specialist. We're going to make that part of the contractual requirement to operate the NAV center for the city. As an example. I mean, one of the concerns with basically <clears throat> using police resources that could be dispatched on the thing was then have some other secondary system as a transportation system. They have the CSOs, so that we don't take a patrol officer to be answering calls. We have CSOs, we have the NCT, and some other stuff, and then we'll have a shuttle too and vouchers. There's multiple, there's about five different pieces to the transportation plan. Yeah. And then, uh, my understanding too, there's going to be two navigation centers, one downtown, and one in the Northwest. There's our navigation center that's going to be on a tutor no more. There's a planned navigation center downtown that is at least a year away, and I have no operational parameters. So, uh, being it's private, you know, it could be a lot like Covenant House. They get to decide their future where we service all citizens where they are. We take all comers, and that's the difference. Is that we are required to be that diverse recipient where somebody else can say, we just want to take in veterans, for instance. I'm not saying we do, we don't know what they're going to do. They haven't identified their role in the system yet. We have to engage them in the community to practice and ask them to come to the table. But they haven't, they haven't, they're not in a place, they're a year away from being operational. So they're a year behind us, essentially, sir. Okay. Great. This meeting is for the they just released That's correct. You pull up the site plan that the one we have showing the parking area. Okay, this one here. Okay. A few questions on the on the site here. There's an existing fence that we go around APD evidence storage. That's gonna stay, right? Okay, it has to. We'll say it again. Right. Okay. Yes. There is another existing fence, I believe, going around APD. Uh, that, that'll probably that'll be altered as part of this plan. It'll have to be a little bit more substantial. 
um, for the evidence, or I mean for the navigation center, but we'll connect to the evidence storage lot and then have a more reinforced perimeter. The more showing there's traffic throughout the gate to the navigation center, you have to go into the AP part of the right there, there's a gravel road, I believe, going to the AP or the evidence storage. Well, that's all paved. Oh, it is paved? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and if you look at Google Earth, if you look at satellite images, it's not right. They show a brand new evidence storage lot. It's really nice. Okay. And then it doesn't show that paved road. Those two projects were done simultaneously. Okay. And um, I, for, they must have took the satellite image in between the two phases of work. But it, it constantly comes up in design meetings about it, it looks like grass, and then you go out there first and it's paved. But yes. Okay. But yes, uh, I mean, you, you see, so down there by the text box, AP staff parking, you would come in, turn left in that, in that driveway, come up towards the navigation center, follow the flow of the arrows, and then take a right and come exit out onto that driveway. The arrows kind of show um, kind of our, our fire egress. We have to maintain a perimeter around the building. And so that just kind of shows the flow of, you know, personnel, operations, supervision, all that. Okay, are you going to have enough room parking? Yes, I'll, I'll hold this up. I know it's probably hard to see right now, but this this was from a design meeting yesterday with the EP. This will be my minor alterations to adjust the flow a little bit. Um, but you know, with, with stakeholder engagement with everybody from UAA to AP to South Central to ANTHC to everything, these comments just come in and we accommodate best we can. And, and this is what happens. <laughs> Yeah, the designer no, yeah. yeah. Can I just to add to that from a Title 21 perspective, well, because we have to look at both uses, there is more than enough parking yeah. on the site. Exactly. Yes, we have. And we have room to get in with birch trees and public culture. We have a 1% art requirement too, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, this looks like a vehicle, vehicular flow here. Tell me you make a right. Are those going to be backing only parking? 45 degree ones there? Uh, below the, the arrow, right below navigation center text, yeah. those will be, it looks like we're going to change that to uh, diagonal parking. Diagonal now. We're going to reverse the direction so it maintains the direction of the arrow. Okay. And then, um, yeah, that way there'll be a s more sufficient drop off area and then stay with the flow of the traffic. Okay. So that we had a change just happened yesterday on that. Okay. I worked on the stalling of the storage country. Uh, sort of doing very well. You generally have to have about 10 feet from the edge of the building or more to handle snow. Right. So it's going to come off of this thing and shed it. That's how it was on. Right. Um, that big idea, try to figure that out. It's a big idea to work on that for you. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. We have a building in the city's portfolio that's very similar I mean, to this, and so it's, it's a known element. <laughs> we, we, we did a site walk in that one, and we consistently reference that work with that engineering team as well. Right. One of those slow calls appears to be Right. Right. And that kind of ties into the operational plan. And as we talk about building safety, it, there's an emphasis on that removal piece. Awesome. Yeah. One of my concerns is the panel's got a great lot of things in the middle of the It's cost. You know, we, you know, we make that additional use from that, and maybe there may need to be another million dollars for landscaping. We're going to have to come out of some budget somewhere. Um, yeah. we, we've estimated landscaping. Uh, yeah. it, is an, it's just, it is a feature of work, uh, no doubt. Uh, so. It's known right now as captured as a feature of work. Okay. And then, uh, this is the whole file has been on for a long time, and all of a sudden, it gets moved out. This part of like COVID 19, or we have done this, at all. We've done this before, uh, like sooner than COVID 19, we've gotten like our money to make the whole thing. Or? Well, I, I think that's a really challenging question, but I'll answer it. Um, as you know, the mayor's been in office. We are all, we all came on board with the new mayor. He took over July 1. And since then, he's made this a focus of his administration. That's why he's here tonight. 
And I would say that we probably should have been dealing with this 30 and 40 years ago. You know, um, we should probably be dealing with it statewide, just not in Anchorage. Um, but I will say to you that, you know, the alcohol tax a year ago prompted us to enter onto this new path. So passing that alcohol tax really tripped a lot of this stuff. COVID-19 definitely exacerbated the homeless situation across the nation and put a lot of people in peril. I think we all know people that have been, um, you know, financially affected by the COVID. And then you have the huge housing problem that, you know, the housing cost problem. I think my house has probably doubled in value in two years, sadly. I mean, I'm happy about it as a homeowner, but then I'm like, wow, what does that do for the people that were looking for their first house? Those first houses are now $400,000 instead of $150,000, So it's a challenging time to see. It's not just homelessness. That's what we're trying to say. This, this problem is systemic. It's, it's access to medical care. You know, a ton of providers dipped out during this that I'm going to retirement. We, have, we haven't seen a whole housing boom, have we? So like we had in the 80s here, when 70s and 80s. So there's a lot in play besides homelessness. But no, this was not based on that. It was just that the alcohol tax passed on its second try. Um, they've been trying to fix it in 18, like Saxton said, we took the bold step of starting to prop up financially some of these community providers that have been out of pocket. We've asked churches to have warming centers for many, many years to take in citizens of the city, and they did that at great cost to themselves, manning all night long to keep people from freezing to death, and the city saw an issue and reacted to it. And I'm going to take a quick moment and say I'm really thankful that it took some people a bold step. This was a giant step for the assembly members and, and the mayor to take this thing on because everyone else had just kind of put the blinders on. So I'm thankful to be on the team dealing with this. It was a bold step for the city to do this thing. I don't know if it's the right or wrong direction. I feel it's the right direction, but we're moving at least now, which we hadn't done in 40 years. And hopefully the state catches up to us and follows Anchorage. I like leading the way. Um, and I'm hoping we're going to do it statewide. But we've done it here, and I think it, but it was not COVID. It, it was just that we, it was time to take a step. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to add to that um, yesterday uh, we announced uh, with the Homeless Leadership Council, this deals with the fiscal thing going forward on this, is that this is a statewide problem because a lot of Many of the homeless come from other cities, even outside, and uh, as well as within Alaska. Um, we're going to have a uh, coordinated effort with Homeless Leadership Council and the municipality on making an ask uh, going forward with the legislature to help fund homeless, the, the homeless issue um, in Anchorage going forward. That is a continuous funding stream every year. We don't know the amount. We're, we're just getting the um, the beginning of that process, because we have to know what the aggregate amount is. We, we can't make an ask if we don't know what the amount is. And that's going to be a heavy lift for all of the HLC uh, 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 participants uh, going forward, because in September, October is when you pre file the bills that you want to be heard in the next session, January. Uh, you, you, you want to be pre filed and you want it ready to go and early in the stack so the legislature. And we'll be dealing with a lot of the people because, what, 59 of 60 seats are up for election. So, but we want to be early because the reason is this is quite clear. It's, it's taxpayers here. Is the taxpayer of anchors cannot, can no longer bear the burden of the statewide problem. It's, it's not right. It's not fair. And um, so we're going to make that ask. But we must, we have to do that intelligently and we have to do it accurately. We can't over ask. We certainly can't under ask. Um, so that's kind of, that's a long-term thing, but, you know, uh, uh, less than a year from now, we should have an answer on that, and and, and this, this funding issue will be spread out, we hope, between the state, the muni, uh, corporations at large, uh, native corporations, uh, non-profits, and, and possibly federal government, because there's always little pots of money here and there, but this is a business, and we need, we need the budget. Our taxpayers can't do pay for this whole thing. So, thanks. Yeah, that's that was really up to sort of the operational costs that have to come from. For the long term, for the short term, we might cover it through our federal overspends, but the alcohol tax, of course, there's other ways to use that money as well, because we need some value. So, we don't necessarily see the parks department get cut, you know, on this, and certainly. Oh, it's a great question. So, 
Uh, as the mayor said, we're looking at all those things. We're constantly looking. We're shaking trees, you know. Um, but I will tell you, you know, one of the predicating events here is that the FEMA response funding for that gets reduced by 25% come July 1. So some of our reaction is that there's been this take that there's all this free money on the table. Well, it's our money we get reimbursed. So um, you know, that, that reimbursement percentage is about to drop. So that has also prompted on the FEMA response side some of the hard decisions we make on the incident response side. Then we have the homeless response side of the what we call steady state operations. If you're dead on, um, the alcohol tax has money set aside for emergency sheltering, which is the warming center, and day engagement. So this day engagement piece, before we even built this building, had a funding stream. So when we go away from the residential piece of it and we get functional zero, we will have a reoccurring revenue stream. Uh, the operation of the sheltering side, as the mayor has made a commitment, is not coming out of alcohol tax or your tax dollars. It's going to hopefully come out of the ARPA money. The ask has been for the two years of operating the sheltering side that that be paid for out of the ARPA dollars. And so that's our ask of the ARPA, the administration, so some other stuff. But we've always identified that money as the best possible because it doesn't affect you taxpayers and our property taxes. Thank you. Great questions. Yeah, one reason I get the money is because we're seeing construction costs. This building started to go up thirty to 40%. Last year, this year, we've seen the costs go up more than 30 to 40%. Um, so, um, so the question I have uh, is actually, do we, do we have a negotiated contract yet to pick up the floor? Where are we at on the maximum cost? Uh, we don't. I don't. Michelle, you know, we're still negotiating the guaranteed maximum price on the materials. Um, right now, I, I think the big thing that changed was the occupancy that you saw. Right. When it went from 330 uh, down to the 150 and 50 right. surge, right. Uh, big elements like that that changed when the assembly and the, and the administration agreed on those key features of work, and it kind of changed the scope a little bit. So, right. um, also the budget when the budget changed, I believe it just you know just last week or you know it was about a week and a half ago. So when that budget was really defined at $10 million, really trying to bring that uh, the scope of work within, I don't want to say de-scoping, but one of those creative ideas, you probably remember one of the needs was to bring the, uh, the restrooms and the showers right. outside, yeah. inside. Yeah. So we're exploring all those, but just changed the negotiations of the GMP. Okay. So uh, still in negotiations, but we're firm in that. Like, like, you, like I just showed you the charrette from um, right. yesterday's AP meeting. That will turn, we have to turn that over to the 35% schematic design, which will reflect in the new revised estimate. So the estimate and schedule is catching up with the stakeholder desires okay. yeah, while trying to meet the objective. Okay. And the last question, you know what? I have a lot of questions. So the, the answer to that is I don't envision that, but we have a board, but no, that's now, this comes up regularly. Can we accept service animals? Absolutely. We've had service animals at the Sullivan, true service animals at the Sullivan. You know, we've had somebody that was visually impaired that had a true dot dog, and that is accepted. We have to, it's a, it's a federal requirement that we would get sued under discrimination law. But you no, know, they cannot bring their hamster cage and set up their hamster and guinea pig operation at the uh, navigation center. But the specifics on that, you're pretty far down in the weeds. We envision having the the uh, administrative board set those kind of things. People have asked, is there going to be discipline? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not the Wild West. What that looks like, I can't answer you. It's not that I don't want to. We expect our community of practice to guide us in crafting those things, having appeals, just like we have in the Salt. There's an appeals board. If you get removed, they get back in there. Um, it'll function more appropriately in a more appropriate situation. Securing a place that has 37 external doors is a challenge. Uh, we won't have that challenge at the uh, navigation center. It was, it was purpose built versus being shoehorned into something meant for 6,600 hockey fans. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to having a structure that's the right fit. I think we've all been there. Using the right tool for the right job makes all the difference. Okay. All right. Look forward to seeing some of this operations coming in. Appreciate taking the time. We, we really do appreciate going in. Thanks for giving us a chance to answer some of these things because I think it's, it's it, it, I get that it's scary. I mean, and I'm nervous, right? And I get for folks that haven't heard some of the things and then a rumor gets out there. Um, but we plan on addressing every one of these and they'll be in process. And that board is diverse. It has people from the community councils, public safety committee, commission, 
uh, the housing, the hand commission. I mean, it is a diverse, uh, an assembly member, it is a diverse board. So it's not gonna be just, it's not 13 of um, you know our folks, it's 13 or 14 or 18 people from a diverse cross section of this community because we're all about making this thing run right, not just running it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I think uh, that concludes our, our presentation. Is there any more questions? Would you like to finish, James? James, oh, go ahead. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Blake. Um, I live in uh, the UACC area. Um, I think I'm going to the mile radius. A couple questions, a couple of thoughts uh, as I've been sitting here uh, tonight. Um, really appreciate some more detail on this. Um, you know, as a uh, parking council I'm a member, not a, a board member, um, has really been uh, asking for more information about what the plan is here um, and uh, hopeful to get some more uh, specifics about the operations plan um, as well as kind of the, the neighborhood uh, mitigation plan. Um, I did have a quick question on, uh, just as I was as sitting here listening, um, it sounds like people will not be able to take the bus here for free, is that right? Well, there is going to be an active bus stop out in June. There's an inactive bus stop that's been yeah. off all It'll be reactivated. We can't stop people from taking the bus. This comes up, you know, it's Alaska, they have the same civil rights as you and I do if they want to own a firearm. We're not going to allow them to clean their gun in the shelter, right? Like we have a plan to secure dangerous things in a locked area, but we can't turn them away because they want to ride the bus. If they want to get on the bus, we are not going to provide bus passes. Is that the question? Yeah. So, like, if someone is in a in a situation where they're they're struggling, they can't get to this facility. We have rides for them. We have okay. vouchers, so we would issue a voucher to to either a transportation. If it, this is where it gets tough. If they're in, in a wheelchair, we send a cab ambulance, you know, a lift vehicle. Um, if they're just generally, we could get them on anchor rides. Um, if it's somebody that has some other challenges, we may be able to get them a voucher. We have a, a voucher system through the feds that we can cut you a voucher. And Uber or Lyft can deliver them, for instance. We can send a, a shuttle bus up through anchor rides, too. So there's a lot. The transportation plan does cover that. But it's not make your way there. We actively find you where you are and navigate you to here. Just a plug for transit. If you're an Illinois employee, it's yeah. you get to ride for free. You <laughs> can use your badge. So. so we ride the bus. Yeah, we'll just train as well. Yeah. Or I was in train last year. Great. Right now, and uh, as far as like the the ideas, there I've, I've seen some presentations where there's um, you know more enforcement against. Camping or uh, tonight, I think we talked about loitering in the area. What does that look like um, kind of in practice when you walk over the bridge and there's, you know, like that and there's several, um, you know, uh, benches and people congregate anyway because um, they're at, you know, ANTHC and they're, you know, they're kind of family or services there. What, what have you, like, what does that, what does that mean? Like, are you, Looking to like move people off these benches if there's day, you know, day people, or um, I guess like how does the you know, or is it just like you're looking for camps and um, you know people can't put a tent overnight or uh, what? Is, what does that look like? In your right. So there's a, so it's not me, it's the law. And yeah. so, I mean, I mean that honestly. We no, trust this. We operation. Yes. Right. So we yeah. have a zero tolerance zone for camping within a certain distance of the um, navigation center. Um, and that's the, the deal. We're also going to have a zero tolerance for outdoor burning, whether you're just congregating or not. You're gonna, we don't allow outdoor burning in the city anyways, but we're going to have an emphasis on that, you know, the, the, the addressing that quickly through the fire department. There's a fire action plan coming together. There's a fire-wise design through Saxton. But as far as across the street, it's a different story. Some of those benches I know where you're referring to, they actually live on um, somebody else's property. Um, and we, we can't keep people from Congress. This has been a historic problem. The court has addressed sleeping on sidewalks, their public spaces. The idea being, the true idea that works here is we make the navigation center the better option. So 
we, we're not going to serve a snack over there. So you want a snack, come on into the day engagement center. That's the draw, right? And so, uh, and that's how we use that facility to lessen the impact on your community. And that's going to be the real piece that we, we make sure that if they're close there, we get them into that shelter uh, and that day engagement center, that navigation center to get the services. So that bench isn't the best option, it's the worst option. And then we want them to take the best option, which is food, shelter, navigation, housing. Yeah, I appreciate it. And then camping, does that require the 10 day notice like everywhere else um, in the city? So the 10 day does not apply to um, public safety issues. So there are there are pieces of code that can address that. Um, but yes, you know, the, uh, the and I think Saxton's addressing that too by invading some of the sites that are um, public Saxton taking. Yeah, so I mean, the reason we're here for the conditional use purposes because we're changing kind of the use of, of this property. Um, and by doing that, it's also enforcing, you know, how it will be used to monitor and supervised. And so that is kind of incidental to how we will operate at the navigation center. So uh, it's part of our safety plan, but it's also part of operations. And so we, when we really firm up our operations plan with the perimeter controls and all that, they did firewise mitigation, you know, moving the vegetation and all that. Everything is incidental. You know, we can't allow camping because we can't we can't expose residents to the risk of fire. So everything is tied together with that plan. And so that's why we, we it'll likely be a zero. I mean, it's going to be zero. I mean, it's not firm enough, so I don't want to say zero tolerance, but that's the direction we're going with that decision. It it, it will be um, the fire mitigation to protect Stockton and Heights, the whole Campbell area. We're, we're, we're down to the level, we used to have fire breaks in there, we're looking at putting bulldozers in there. We gotta work with BLM because they own a chunk of that. And, and remaking, re, re, uh, de-vegetating the, the, uh, the fire breaks so they're effective again. And, and that's gonna, there's gonna be a cost. And it was just like they said, uh, or Joe said, was that this is an emergency area and this has nothing to do with the homeless area. We're looking at spruce people kill it's summertime is coming. We have to have a plan to protect them, whether it's a lightning strike or, or a homeless camp. We've had them both. So fire mitigation on the hillside, as far as homeless goes, we're and the lawyers are looking at this. We think we can declare that as an emergency fire area, and then there's just zero tolerance for any camping in that area. So something something uh, James had said earlier triggered me to go back. I'm reading Martin versus Boise again, and and it caused me. Have a question that I just sent to our lawyers a few minutes ago. Um, Martin versus Boise, which is the case measure decision. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah, the yeah, yeah. Familiar with that? It, it doesn't say in the conflict between the two judges and their decision. It didn't say you can't mitigate camps. It there, there's actually opportunities to do just that um, effectively and quickly. So um, I just asked them to give you a, review this again and come back tomorrow. We need to find a path to. Be compassionate for homeless. We don't want to criminalize homelessness. We, you can't do that. It's not moral or legal. But we uh, we also uh, have to protect citizens' homes from, from fire that may be caused by homeless. So it's the ongoing we have to operate. And to the mayor's point, you know, the navigation center gives us that tool that you know, we have those beds available for Boise. And so that's the real and navigating people where they're turning over. So getting those people through housing keeps that pool of beds available hopefully you know getting to the right center so they're not sitting at the Sullivan if they're if we can get into Hope Center we get into Hope Center for instance that's the piece that we don't have now that creates that bed but you know in a perfect world we always have 150 open beds at that thing I mean I, I know that's not realistic but in the perfect world that allows us to do all the things that you need for your community to be safe and secure and having this center I know it's a hard way to see it but it really does provide all the things you're asking about not in your local parks and neighborhoods safer because and again making it an inviting place with all the services why would i want to be on the street i can go get a nice cup of pilates coffee and a, and a hot sandwich and that's where i want to be way better than asking someone for it i can go over there in the city will give it to me and that's the advantage for all those communities that have been highly impacted by whether it be panhandling car crowds that go on and all the things that that James spoke to in his neighborhood down here in the Sullivan. We're not happy about it, but you know, it's one of those things that we've got to take the right step, and this is the right step to start facing those systemic problems. Appreciate it. Um, just a couple questions on the process 
uh, for the, um, there's an application at the end of May uh, on your uh, slide there. Um, what, what kind of operational details um, sort of will be filled out between now and then? Like how much more detail is that application than sort of the, you know, because I know you're still formulating and obviously submitting, you know, operations for contracts and that sort of thing. Um, like what's required of that uh, beyond what we've seen on the slides? Well, you know, we'll, when you're doing the CVP process, I'll let you speak to it in more depth. I have to identify what my rough idea is for the structure, right? Like, and so I can't just say I'm doing a building. I want to do a medical. It's going to be have X-ray machines and the same kind of thing. We'll identify the overarching services that the navigation center is going to offer. I know the question is who's the provider. It comes up all the time, right? And so that will not, and that is not required as part of the process. We have to say that we're going to have medical services and beating and um, all the things that we've talked about tonight. Uh, I'll get foggy late in the day, but you know, the map showed it whether, but we're not going to list it's podiatry, cardiology, and internal medicine. We're going to say we have overarching, we're going to have a medical clinic, we're going to have, um, you know, social services, we're going to have, um, you know, licensing services, and we'll tell you the things. The idea being that if we had something that um, was offensive to the community, but you're going to have, a, um, you know, an on-site um, lockdown drug, we have no, no, no. We would have to identify that, so that would be the CPP process. But you've heard 90% of the things that will be on that application, uh, and there will be no surprises for the community. It's all the things that the homeless need to be successful. Um, and then what is, like, uh, I've seen, you know, obviously, trucks for a number of months, um, and it's being three times. What, what are the construction activities that can happen before that um, August 6th, 2018, uh, zoning approval? Assume approval. Um, I think the, the definition that allows any kind of uh, or, or uh, work would probably be site preparations. Everything from you know, the, the clearing, grabbing, utility work. So that's the future work that could proceed ahead of that. Um, and then a couple just kind of overarching kind of comments, questions uh, regarding the city's uh, almost response. Um, it sounds like there's an administrative board uh, that will be responsible or over, overall in charge of the operations um, vision as well as kind of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, thing here that you talked about. There's that the homeless negotiating board. What well, you mentioned 14 members. Sorry. So there's no decision made. So there's a bunch of things in play. The mayor was re referencing a homeless leadership council. Mm -hmm. um, there are there's the community of practice and what we call the COC to the continuum there. There's a lot of things in play. But at this site, um, it is a municipal piece of land and building, so it is city owned. It'll be operated by a contractor, but we will have an advisory board that provides us all that. You know, invite like all those. We the plan is it's not finalized. It's part of another group called the facilitated work group for the legislative drafting here. Three assembly members, three members of the administration uh, on the behest of the mayor, um, and we negotiate these things. So that's in final development. That will be released as part of the CUP process. We'll identify what that looks like to you. Great. Can um, can I just make the suggestion that uh, some representative of that group uh, regularly attends. Our community council because we, we've had yeah. over the past since this idea was uh, announced last year um, it's been really difficult to get uh, answers at our meetings sure so and they're going to have a seat on the board too so the entire intent as it's proposed right now we don't you know it's a negotiating process but the proposal is to have those local community councils that this sits in or touches directly having a seat on that because we know they have the highest um, you know, impact from this center being located where it is. Those community councils need to have a clear voice right to that advisory board and they'll have a seat on it. Oh, great. So that's, that's the great. entire intent when we drafted it, sitting with having a public safety committee member and a member of the hand commission. That was the idea and, and, and an assembly member. So, you know, your voice is, is, is going to be a diverse, it's not a, it's not a bunch of uh, people from the health department. It's going to be, in fact, we don't have a couple of seats just because they're by the fall uh, where the finance are going to need to help facilitate the distribution of the tax money. Apple tax money. Great. Um, 
Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, one more quick thing, since I'm sure we're uh, running low on time. Um, we talked about uh, substance abuse um, treatment and facilities uh, a little bit tonight. Um, I understand that some of the funding for uh, constructing this navigation center is contingent upon pursuing um, municipal housing run uh, treatment facility at the Old Old Mine um, Hotel. Is that still part of the implementation of this? The agreement that was made, they made the assembly um, put a caveat on that we do an RFP program called Mine. It wasn't actually operated as a city facility. They uh, required us to, they required three or four things. One was a cap down from 330. The second was that we wouldn't surge in unless we had exhausted all the locations. Uh, that we would do an RFP for, um, you know, uh, drug treatment. I believe, I don't have it right in front of me, I believe it said drug treatment at the old Golden Lion, and we will RFP for services there. We did an RFP earlier. We've done an RFP in the last year for drug treatment at the uh, Golden Lion. Yeah, I, I need to make it real clear. The Golden Lion is being sold. We have two bidders for it right now, so we're, we're not using the Golden Lion for treatment of their homeless facilities. So I just want to. So there's no plan to expand capacity of treatment services? Not what was said. You asked, was the gold line going to be used? And I'll tell you, um, the health department went out and met with providers, and they absolutely didn't like that spot because of the closed off rooms. Um, they said, maybe we could use a couple rooms. So uh, obviously, the mayor has much better information than me. That's, that's not in the health department for real estate. but. Uh, I would say there's absolutely a look right now. We're working with our state partners that control a lot of those facilities and looking with the mental health trust trying to find funding streams. So I'm not saying we do, but I mean, I think we just talked about opening 60, 68 beds down at 660. So I absolutely, we're still moving forward. We're financing that, we're helping finance that. So, I mean, that is literally community tax dollars being used for treatment beds. And part of that is the additional pillars that will come online and be the, you know, the focus after the navigation center comes online. And I know Larry Baker, you, you did a great job narrating that. And so, you know, I think the next step is the workforce housing element to really accommodate it and help offset really the real expensive rent that we're experiencing in Anchorage to help you know, bring, you know, that talent to Anchorage. So um, you, you'll see that become an emphasis later on as well, along with the, you know, the other treatments and other pillars. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, I watched uh, Mr. Baker's uh, testimony last week, um, so I just want to reiterate that I uh, appreciate you guys working on this. I really hope that um, his emotion and his kind of devotion that came through um, is, you know, kind of continues uh, with the rest of the administration. And I um, appreciate you all being here on a nice sunny afternoon. So, cheers. I can just jump in real quick. I know we're getting down to the wire here, so we're going to set three minute timer just so we can make sure we get through the few minutes. Um, Yarrow? Yarrow? Yeah. Yarrow? Yeah. 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 Is this one of your conditional use permit meetings? Yes. yes. Okay. You know, I'm asking that because other than a link hidden deep in the municipal website, this meeting was not noticed. There are municipal calendars, and you should use those. Portia mentioned this meeting at the FCC meeting last night. However, her reception was so bad. She was cutting in and out. Nobody could hear what she was saying. I emailed her today to ask her what she was saying about a navigation center meeting, because that was really the only words that I heard. She waited until 4.45 to email me back about this meeting. So nobody knew about it, which is obvious by the fact that nobody is here. Okay, and you scheduled it. You didn't even tell the assembly about it. And you scheduled it when they had a different meeting set up, which is obviously you didn't expect them to be able to make it because you're sitting in their seats. So what is this? We have. No faith in you guys with this process. And this is why. Because you're sneaky and you do things in the dark. You don't notice things properly. 
You don't inform people? It, it's... Thank you. Thank you much for your comments. This uh, meeting was publicly noticed by Dowell, and it was sent out a one-mile radius of the Navigation Center via postcard. And then if you go to muni.org and you hit on the top button, Housing and Homelessness, this meeting is publicly noticed on the muni.org site. Thank you. Why was it sent out? Because nobody got any postcards. Andrew was here earlier. He lives in the neighborhood. He didn't get any postcard. He was expecting the administration to be at his community council meeting tonight. Campbell Park Community Council meeting. Okay? That is the community council where this navigation center, this shelter, is located. And you guys have not met with their community council yet. And you had them on the schedule tonight. And earlier on today, you canceled and told them you were going to be here instead. Lucia spoke to Andrew directly when he was here about that. She, you know, it, there's ongoing correspondence, and we are going to be on the schedule to work with them. We did meet with Bachelor Community Council as well. We did a presentation with them, and but. But we just spoke publicly to Andy directly and apologized for whatever schedule conflict that had happened. But um, I know I work 200 yards away and I have a navigation center postcard as well that came to my office. So I, I also received one and I, I, have, I didn't bring it with me, but I do have it. You, you've been to my office. I've been to your office. I have it on my wall on my whiteboard. So I, I know they were mailed out. Um, I have a check with resident you know, with all of you. Know, there's three residents that have confirmed receipt of the, the postcard as well. But. You know, I'm just saying, if you're going to use this as a conditional use permit meeting, it's a sham. This is a sham. Thank you. Um, I believe that concludes our meeting for tonight. We've received all our comments, um, everything on record. I believe we haven't received anything through email for this meeting tonight. But they also look forward to our next meeting schedule and uh postcards have also been sent out to the residents uh, about that uh, the next invite but thank you so much for attending uh, especially considering how nice it is outside so thank you